really my pleasure to introduce the dynamic duo that will speak about <laughs> therapy. Uh, for atopic dermatitis, our representative is uh, Thomas Bieber. Uh, Professor Bieber serves as chair and director of the Department of Dermatology and Allergy at the University of Bonn. His scientific focus uh, is in the ontogeny and immunobiology of dendritic cells. He's the first describer of IDEX. In fact, he was my role model when I started my uh, footsteps in atopic dermatitis, and I've seen him speak, and I wanted to be like him. <laughs> um, so he had major contributions for um, atopic dermatitis, and I'm delighted to um, have him here. For psoriasis, our speaker is Alexa Kimball, and Alexa has many hats. In addition to being the president of the IPC, Alexa Kimball is also the president and CEO of Harvard Medical Faculty Physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and she's also a professor of dermatology at Harvard Medical School. She has received multiple awards for her research in psoriasis and um, uh, outcomes and has recently been selected as the recipient of the 2016-17 National Psoriasis Foundation Outstanding uh, Physician Clinician Award. So. so, thank you so much for having us here today. We. Um, brought our superhero rings <laughs> in our inaugural across the country's uh, presentation here. Um, so uh, by way first, I think we just wanted to uh, show you our disclosures. Both of us have a number of them as well. So I think one of the very interesting questions as we think about psoriasis and atopic dermatitis and the evaluation of how the pathophysiology both is similar and dissimilar in maps across the two, is to now think about what therapies we have, which works for which, and which ones don't. As uh, already alluded to by Joel, things that work for psoriasis don't always work for psoriatic arthritis, and we certainly see that things that work for atopic dermatitis don't necessarily work for psoriasis, but some of them do. And why is that, given uh, the overlap and, again, the separation between uh, the two areas? So we thought we would start with just some classical therapies. And if you think, again, from a very reductionist standpoint, at, at the beginning of all of this, you have epidermal injury and an immune response to it. And so it is interesting even to just think about what is it about that injury that is different, that sets off these different pathways. And of course, in psoriasis, the activation can later on be repressed, but is semi-permanent in many ways. We can obviously control it quite well now with the new therapies we have, but we never really can erase what has already happened. Uh, and I, no doubt you've already seen a brilliant explication by Jim and Emma about the pathophysiology, so I won't go through that. But it is interesting to consider why, again, once you've set up these uh, APC-presenting cells that seem to geolocalize to the skin and psoriasis, they sit there. And yet, in atopic derm, uh, many of these kids recover and never have it after they reach a certain age. So there's a number of topical anti-inflammatory treatments, of course, for psoriasis that overlap, right? We have steroids, calcineurin inhibitors, coal tar, UV light, and then we have some that do not, which are calcipotriene, which is kind of interesting given the vitamin D uh, role that has been at least explored in atopic derm, um, and then dithranol as well. And I think part of the difference is here, and, and topical steroids are fascinating because they pretty much work for anything, right? Uh, and so it is such a ubiquitous pathway and such a powerful pathway that knocks things out that it, uh, figuring out where the secret sauce of that is in a way that uh, reduces some of the side effects is still obviously a very desirable goal for all of us. And yet for psoriasis, we remain pretty disappointed, I would say, with the calcineurin inhibitors topically, where we get some positive effects, but not really as much bang for a buck as we need to keep people under control. You can use them of areas of thinner skin with some uh, improvement, but they're just not there. Coal tar, of course, um, and again, when I was in training, which was a while ago, but not that long ago, uh, we were coating people in coal tar and having them sit in our clinics for 40 hours a week. So it is really wonderful to think about the revolution we've seen uh, in topical uh, and treatments there where we don't need to do that for patients much of the time. And then, of course, UV light ubiquitously seems to help many things except for skin cancer. <laughs> so we have to keep an eye on that. So not a lot of, I would say, recent progress in topicals for psoriasis, a huge amount, as we'll talk about in the systemic therapies. Uh, and this leads to the challenge, which I think is similar for both, which is that 
for our patients with mild or mild to moderate disease, we don't have any, um, we, we haven't gotten to sort of the silver bullet, which is could we get somewhere where we put something on once a day and really keep this under control? I mean, once a week is what I'd really like to see, um, where we would have a more remittive, long-lasting topical effect and not have to have the systemics. Um, in terms of our traditional systemics, we do have quite a number. Again, acetretin and uh, I'm not so sure about fumarates as we don't use them so much in the US, but for atopic derm, we, we certainly would use the others there as well. These uh, traditional therapies typically have a response rate using a PASI 75 of 30 to 50 percent. Not dissimilar to some of the early biologics that we saw, but certainly outclassed in some ways by the newer therapies we currently have available. And so the value of these, of course, that I've just shown is that we do have a nice, I mean, that's you know, 10 different options for our patients. We can scale them based on the severity that we see and uh, range both dosing and potency in order to get there and think about the comorbidities of our patients. Uh, but we still have a real challenge for an unmet need, um, although, again, for our more moderate to severe, we have a lot of wonderful options. This group, uh, and as I would posit, probably the atopic derm group uh, across that spectrum still have a number of areas to improve. So, so just to comment, um, because um, I was just thinking about the genetics and, and related to the issue of the barrier function from which we know in this disease it's, uh, it's really an issue. And I'm not sure that this is a secondary issue I think we all agree that the barrier dysfunction in atopic dermatitis is really one of the primary movements of the whole thing. And uh, coming back to the, the initial question of that meeting, is atopic dermatitis and psoriasis one disease or even two parts of the spectrum? I think that we, we learned a lot about the differences between the two diseases, particularly also in terms of barrier function. So clearly, in contrast to the psoriasis, where when you're looking at the normal appearing skin, there is apparently nothing which is happening there in terms of inflammation or uh, disturbance of the barrier function. The situation is completely different in atopic dermatitis. And that's also the reason why in terms of management and the classical management of this disease always have to focus on these two particular aspects. That's what I am explaining to my patients every day to really take care about the skin and not only the skin which is involved the lesional skin, but all the skin from the head to the feet. And this is particularly interesting and important also for the kids uh, while the disease seems to emerge and to develop. And on the other hand, we have the problem of the chronic inflammation. And that's the reason why in terms of advice to the patients classically, we, we always have to focus on these aspects. The emollients, what we call the basic therapy on one hand, and the anti-inflammatory agents on the others. A few words about the, let's say, old-fashioned kind of treatment which are currently experiencing a kind of revival. One, one example is urea. I think everybody has used urea in any kind of emollient mixture, and recently it has been shown that this molecule seems to be far more active than we initially thought in terms of, uh, let's say, hydration. In fact, these authors have shown in a GID paper some years ago that, in fact, urea is able to induce on one hand or to increase in one hand, on one hand the expression of filigree and other molecules which are key for the barrier function. And on the other hand, interestingly enough, urea is also able to increase the production of antimicrobial peptides, which we know are quite reduced in the skin of these individuals. Another example is Colta, very old-fashioned treatment. And recently it has been shown that in fact Colta is binding in the skin to the so-called AHR, which is a kind of xenobiotic receptor, which is inducing a lot of different kind of signals. The good news with Coltar is that at least in atopic dermatitis, again, this kind of molecule is able to modulate the expression of epidermal proteins, including filagrin and others. And on the other hand, it seems to be a little bit um, anti-inflammatory in that it is decreasing spongiosis and other mechanisms. So you see, these are two typical example of what we call old-fashioned topical treatment from which we now learn that they are probably doing much more than we expected initially. And in terms of 
treatment specifically um, focusing on the inflammation, I think we are still limited in our uh, ability to really control the disease. We have two main family of, of, of components, topical steroids and the TCIs. Both have advantages and, um, and disadvantages. We are all facing the issue of corticophobia. We are also in the last years increasingly facing the issue of pimecrotacrophobia. And this does really not uh, facilitate our management of the patients. A few words about the UV light. I've seen many discussions about UV light, especially in the, the discussions we had in the IEC, whether we should place UVB narrow band treatment somewhere in the middle between topical steroids or topical treatment overall and systemic treatment. I see the UV light treatment a little bit different. I think it's a kind of add-on that we provide, or I personally provide to my patients, particularly in the winter time. We don't need UV light treatment in the summertime, but many patients, in fact, need some kind of UV light in the winter type. And this also, as we know, is increasing a lot of things in the skin. It has an antipyretic e effect. It is increasing, of course, vitamin D3 synthesis, and it has also some antibacterial properties. So in other words, I think the UV light has a, ve a very important uh, stand in our, in our management of these patients, and we need this particularly in the winter time. With regard to the systemic treatment, we are not so lucky as you guys in the psoriasis uh, field. Unfortunately, the, the huge story which starts, I think it was in 2005, with the first uh, anti-TNF alpha agents is just about to starting now. Um, uh, I think we, we may hear in the next days or weeks the, the, the approval of the FDA for dupilumab uh, for the treatment of these patients. But so far, and this is just for the US, we are not about having the, 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 the approval in Europe yet. But so far, how did we handle these patients? How did we manage these with the more severe forms? And interestingly, the situation was very delicate because at least in Europe, we, we have at some countries in Europe, not in all, we have an approval for cyclosporin A. So cyclosporin A by essence is in fact the first line systemic treatment that we are applying to our patients. And if it fails or the patients have side effects, kidney toxicity, blood pressure issues, or we are going outside of the one year or two years maximal treatment that we just allows, then we have to have plan B anyway. And the plan B usually are other kind of immunosuppressive drugs like azathioprine, methotrexate, and MMF. Don't try to use anti-TNF-alpha or something similar in atopic dermatitis. Despite some very restricted reports and uh, single cases, it doesn't work. And surprisingly enough, omalizumab anti-IG doesn't work either. Why it is so, we don't know. We would expect that for a disease which is somehow related to IgE synthesis and IgE-mediated um, allergy, it should work. But it definitely does not work. Whether this is an issue of concentration, of doses, of heterogeneity of the disease, we don't know finally. And I would just add, I think, uh, one of the issues for topical therapy is that the psoriasis patients tolerate more irritation than the atopic derm, and I think that's why some of the things like dithronol and other things might work, except yeah. they, it can't, you can't manage through that. Um, so uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about the pathogenesis, and again, not to be uh, too redundant, <coughs> but to point out that at least in psoriasis, we have um, developed a much more sophisticated map. Uh, it's interesting if I go back to my slides from 2000 of what I was presenting, it was actually an inverted diagram. So uh, a lot of research has been done uh, that has really brought this out. And it's clear from this that TNF plays an expansive role. Uh, and again, that's part of the reason why it's sort of surprising in some ways that it has no effect, except that it indicates the pathways really do have to be different. But IL-17 seems to have a very interesting and specific role for the mucosa in the skin um, as part of those defense systems. And again, when you think about where we need the mo most robust initial immune response, it would be the lungs, 
the gut and the skin. Uh, there's some paradoxes between the gut and the skin, I think, that are emerging as well. But we even see in our topical therapies that there is an impact on those IL-17 pathways, uh, in addition to, of course, the new biologic pathways that we have that are quite targeted. So what a wonderful era, right? Again, back in, I started using TNF agents in psoriasis back in 1998 when they had first started to be approved and I was at NIH and we could kind of mess around with things there. Um, and we weren't doing it right. It really took the rigorous clinical controlled trials to get the right dosing, um, which I think is a, just a critical uh, lesson that we've already addressed, but as we move these fields forward. But you look at where we were, which was a 49% PASI 75, and now we are in an era where we have therapies that are routinely getting two-thirds of our patients to that point. Now again, some of these target pathways that have multiple effects, and what the hope is, is of course, is that we can move into pathways that target even more effectively, but have fewer other side effects to other parts of the system. And again, I think that's why IL-17 inhibition is so appealing. And certainly as we look at uh, the three molecules that are currently either approved or uh, in development, uh, you can see that we're getting now rates 75, 80 percent, and people, again, have moved to this entirely new benchmark that was sort of unconceivable at the beginning of a PASI 90 improvement and a PASI 100 improvement. Another important feature, though, about these is that they do seem to be uh, more durable, perhaps, than the TNF inhibition. And that's a really, I think that comes back to the pathways as we think about them, that where you have multiple effects, you also have the ability to have redundant pathways that are compensatory, in addition to the immunogenicity, which seems to play some role, but maybe not a huge one for many patients, uh, there does seem to be more loss of persistence um, with some of the TNFs than with some of these newer classes of agents. And that is a very hopeful place for us. And even if you look at the eustachinumab data, you can see from the registries the persistence of that drug is better in how patients use it in the real world um, than some of the other agents. So again, sort of step by step, we're tackling the needs. Uh, and uh, what is coming down the pike next, of course, is incredibly exciting, which are the P19 antibodies, which are affecting IL-23, but not IL-12. And there are two or three of them. There's actually more recent data that just came out in JAD from the phase three programs with guselcomab, for example. Um, Tildrakizumab is another. Um, and so we are going to see um, that in rizikizumab. Uh, tremendous data coming out over the next couple years. So every time I think that we're done in psoriasis, we turn another corner. <laughs> so I'm hoping that this will happen for a topic term. I'm also very optimistic about the data that's emerging and where it's taking and allowing for not just therapies, but really refined approaches. Yeah, as I mentioned, we, we are not so lucky as you are. Um, yes. We are just at the beginning of the <laughs> yeah. whole story. <laughs> But the story must start somewhere, and, and, and the starting point of the story is, is a very classical, old-fashioned, I would say, TH1, TH2 paradigm, which um, was uh, described many, many years ago. But this paradigm changed. As you heard from um, Dr. Emma Goodman this morning, um, we, we, are, we have switched in our mind the, the understanding of this disease uh, from a classically uh, local inflammation to a more systemic inflammation to a, from a TH1, TH2 paradigm to a TH2, TH22 paradigm. And this shows you just a, a cartoon from a recent um, uh, review work from Stefan Weidinger and Natalia Novak from my department. And, and, and this highlights again the role of these two kind of, of cells, of TH2 type of cells, or T2 type of cells as we call them now, and TH22. And of course these presumably key cytokines are the primary targets for any kind of approach uh, trying to, 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 let's say, to neutralize this kind of situation. And as we know as an example here, uh, because it has been mentioned so many times, uh, the, um, this uh, new kind of approach, which is uh, the blocking IL-4 and IL-13, by the way, blocking two, anti two um, cytokines by um, in fact, inhibiting their binding to one single chain, which is the alpha chain of the I4 receptor, you may really be able to, to have an impact on that particular disease, but not only on atopic dermatitis, but also on asthma and rhinitis in polyposis nazi, maybe in other kind of T2 related diseases like the um, EUAE or uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, 
or even on fibrotic diseases, since we know that a lot of uh, fibrotic diseases seem to be driven by T2-like uh, kind of profile. So when it comes to test this hypothesis in clinical trials, and, and that's just show you one slide from the most recent paper uh, published from the, the phase three trials, the SOLO1 and SOLO2, you see here that in fact, we, we, we really have a breakthrough here in, in terms of controlling this disease on the, on the long run. Um, but the most important thing is we can even reach a status of our patients, patients which are clear or almost clear. The very famous IgA001 that you are facing in the clinical trials for psoriasis and we as, as well for atopic dermatitis, although it's not validated, nobody knows exactly what it means. But anyway, <laughs> as long as you have score rather than easy and you can correlate this to something that we understand, it's a good news. And in fact, finally, I think it's evident that um, this kind of approach is extremely promising. And I'm still waiting for the long control disease, uh, con long control of the disease, because um, I always mention, this is my favorite um, sentence, anybody can treat the flare, but the most challenging aspect is to control the disease on the long run. And with that kind of compounds in our hand in the future, we will probably be in a much better shape to to control the disease on the long run and potentially also to have an impact on the comorbidities. The problem that we are currently um, facing, and you heard this from Dr. Goodman this morning, is that we have more and more evidence that we are all speaking about atopic dermatitis as a single disease, but the evidence currently is going just in the other direction. If you look at the heterogeneity of the clinical phenotype of that particular disease, you will not be surprised to see that most probably, if you look at the natural history of each individual patient, the age of onset, the severity issue, and many, many other aspects, you have to assume that you are facing a very complex disease, which probably also is underlined by different kind of mechanisms. So in other words, the TH2, TH22 cytokine paradigm may be just valid for a subgroup of these patients. We are learning more and more that probably in the Asian population and the studies which have been run here and shown by Emma Gutmann are, have been done in, in Korea and Japan I'm very curious to see what happens in China because, in fact, this is a, a huge country and, and I've seen a lot of patients with this disease there. And nobody knows exactly what happens in these particular individuals. The ethnic aspect of this disease is of increasing importance and will probably also impact drug development programs, including, of course, the use of targeted therapy with the, the kind of uh, approach like dupilumab. All right, so we've had a great presentation on comorbidities, so we'll just mention very briefly um, just a few things to think about. Um, and I think one of the questions is, is there actually a parallel to uh, the atopic march that we see in psoriasis as well? Um, we do have some data to suggest that, in fact, comorbidities accumulate over time and that they accumulate fairly quickly. Uh, so it's just sort of an interesting paradigm, I think, to start to get our heads around. Uh, and makes us think about what are our prevention programs and our therapeutic manage management of them. And of course, psoriatic arthritis, I think, remains a bit of a conundrum as we think about, it, again, how it is both similar and disparate as well. Um, and this just demonstrates, again, where we see differences in the arthritis and other, but also cardiovascular disease becomes an interesting area to look at which therapies actually have an effect uh, that's beneficial, that's demonstrated. And I would say the data for TNF inhibition has become increasingly robust. I'm not quite sure it's tipped into a, a true positive yet, but it is accumulating that direction. And yet some of the others, um, again, remain uncertain. Uh, so I'll turn here. Yeah, the, the other aspects uh, which has been mentioned in, in details this morning by, uh, by Eric is the issue of the atopic march. And he has nicely shown that there is no one single atopic march, but probably in numerous kinds of trajectories of that particular um, kind of, of, of comorbidities. But the key point is that we learn from all these kind of investigations that most probably, and that's my, my assumption is, that in fact the starting point lies somewhere in the skin. 
So if you see a small um, child, a newborn, which starts the disease, at least it, that's my behavior in face of the parents, I try to convince them that at that time point, when the disease starts, and there is no evidence for anything in terms of IgE sensitization, that's the right point to make a kind of very early intervention to the first inflammatory lesion in order to control the whole thing, hoping that in fact we will be able to control the atopic march. You heard this morning that you can intervene very early in terms of of using very simple measures, like for example using emollients. There are a couple of studies which have been published where, which are showing a huge difference between those kids who have the highest risk to develop atopic dermatitis, whether or not they have been treated with emollients for a period of six months. Whether this has an impact for a longer period of time, as mentioned by Eric this morning, we don't know. My biggest question is I would be very happy to have some kind of biomarkers which would predict which which child is really having a benefit of this kind of very simple measurements. But the fact is, it is possible when we are focusing on the early intervention to have an impact on the disease itself. And, and now, I would say like Martin Luther King, I have a dream. <laughs> My dream is that by using these new kind of compounds like dupilumab and others, from which you suspect that they are really targeting key molecules, not only key molecules for the inflammatory reaction, but also key molecules implicated in the IgE sensitization process, which most probably starts in the skin. So my guess is beyond treating the patients with the ongoing uh, uh, disease, my guess is the highest potential of these molecules is to use them very early in order to stop the whole thing, to stop the progression of the disease, to stop the chronic inflammation, and to stop the atopic march. And even more, we cannot exclude that we cannot only stop the atopic march, but we could eventually also reverse the atopic march. When you look at the patients who have both disease, asthma and atopic dermatitis, this would be something very important. So, my, my statement at the end is like your president. Um, <laughs> let's make therapy of atopic dermatitis great again. <laughs> so we have to the concluding slide. Oh, perfect. <laughs> you know, and I would just say, I think I can't top that, so I just really should stop. Um, but I would just say I think one of the most fascinating things as you think about our therapies, uh, especially as these new targeted therapies are developed, is they have taught us a lot about the disease, right? I think the paradigm of bench to bedside has in many ways just been upended. It's when we take these into patients and our clinical observation of what's happening and what those differences are have dramatically informed our scientific understanding. And of course, the best part is making the patients better. Uh, and so I look forward to you know, our continued improvements. Yeah, and this slide just shows you in the green those few compounds or treatments which are common to both diseases, and you immediately realize, in fact, that there are, of course, some kind of common treatments, but most of the others we are really effective, in fact, are different. And this brings me to the final point, which has been mentioned this morning. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to hear from a genetist that, in fact, what we know since 40 years that atopic dermatitis and psoriasis are two completely different diseases has now been confirmed by the genetics. Uh, I remind you to um, maybe know him still, Professor Eno Christophers from Kiel, who was the, at least the German Pope of uh, psoriasis uh, 30, 40 years ago. He always mentioned in his lectures, atopic dermatitis and psoriasis are two completely different diseases. And he would also say, and for me, they are mutually exclusive. And to be honest, in my 35 years of dermatology career, I think I've seen only two or three patients who have the same disease on the same time. Terrific. So thank you very much for you. your attention. Thank you. Appreciate it.